ahead and get started. My name is Todd Kelman. I'm an engineer and veterinarian here at UC Davis. Welcome to the second of what will be five workshops of the week after week here that we're doing on pasture poultry. Uh, last week, if you missed it, we had Maurice Kotesky doing uh, sort of husbandry. We had Mark Bland, a poultry vet, doing infectious disease. We had Tim Mueller from River Dog Farms talking about pasture management. Today, it's going to be myself talking about poultry housing issues with that. We're going to have Ann Byer from NCAT Natura talking about regulations. And then we're going to have a round table of producers about issues in marketing and economics. And so a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, the webinar is saying that it's not quite loud enough. Not loud enough. Oh my. All right. That's a first. Let's see if we can fix that. Input, input level testing, testing, testing. Trying that one more time. See, so, so for those on the webinar, if we could get uh, a bunch of people, there's a chat window there. If we could get a bunch of people giving us feedback as to whether they can hear me or not, let's get a smattering. Let's make sure it's not just that one person. The audio did okay last time. What yeah, do we got, Annie? Good. Yeah. All right. So if you're the if you're not able to hear, make sure your speakers are up all the way, that you've got selected uh, whatever speaker output you want, whether it's your headphones or, or whatnot. Yeah, so most of the indication is that we're going to be okay. If you're still having trouble, try to go through chat, and Annie, who's manning the chat, will try to help you out. Now, speaking of web stuff, this is being recorded. It will be available after the show. It takes us a couple of days to edit. We will be sending out a link to everyone in attendance and online, so you can do that. We'll also be sending out links of resources about everything we're going to be talking about, including our presentations, so you will have all of that. Uh, questions, if you're online, if you're here, feel free to ask any time. Uh, I'm happy to answer. I know everybody else is, too, as we're going along. There's, for you in here, see those big white speakers up, the, the rectangles up on the ceiling there. Those are actually the mics. They're really good. In fact, they're almost too good. They're going to pick everything up in the room. When I listened to the recording last time, I can pretty much hear everything. So everybody's conversations, yeah. So try to keep the conversations to a minimum, the people wrestling to a minimum. But the good news is if you ask a question, it's going to pick up really well. So that's good. Um, if you have a question online, just use the chat box. We'll try to get to them if we can. If there's any unanswered questions, we will answer them at sort of later when we send out the resources. We'll make sure we get to everybody there. Okay. Um, and I think that's it for logistics. Anything else, Anne, that I have forgotten? Anne or Annie for uh, housekeeping purposes? If, if anybody needs restrooms, that's not online. If you're online, you're on your own. If you are in here, just go out, back around. It's going to be that first hallway to the left. Go down, and you're going to see a couple of different ones. There's a women's only, and then there's a single, like, mixed privacy-type restroom. Okay? And if anyone needs anything else, please do not hesitate to ask us. So I'm going to go until about, I think, 10 after. We kind of forgot to schedule breaks, so we're going to schedule a break here as we have five minutes in between each. So let's get going because we've got a lot to cover in regards to poultry housing. So I have a list of considerations when it comes to poultry housing. This is one of the things I'm going to send you guys. Uh, I always get such great ideas in interacting with you, so I want to make sure I get updates as a result of all our conversations and I'll send it out. 
it, it's not groundbreaking. It's just things to think about when you're thinking about what your poultry housing is going to be. And when you look at all the things I'm going to show you, there's two real big picture things to keep in mind, which is what do chickens need and what do you need? And truth be told, most of this is geared towards layers. We will be talking a little broiler, but most of it's towards layers. And there's a couple of reasons for that that we'll go over in a second. But you know, things that you need, you need easy access to eggs, right? You need easy access to the hens, especially if one gets sick in the back of a coop, you need to be able to go in and access relatively easily. Access to feeders and waters, so you can maintain them, make sure they're clean. Uh, you need to be able to easily clean and disinfect the poop. And then considerations of movability. How often are you going to be moving it, if at all? Are you going to be doing the rotational type system where you are maintaining the pasture? So that pasture will get eaten down. You're going to have to move the coop at some frequency, depending upon how many birds on how much pasture and how fast they're going to get down. And so uh, considerations about how movable you need your coop. And we're going to show a few different uh, designs and approaches towards movable coops, some more movable than others. Uh, in terms of what chickens need, this is where things get interesting, especially here in California. Uh, the first thing that I want to address is they need to be able to exhibit natural behavior. And I use that terminology for a reason. And that reason is in California, Prop 2 and Prop 12. So for those of you in the room, how many people, other than those from Georgia, know about Prop 2 and Prop 12? Raise your hands higher, let me see. So yeah, about half, which is actually not bad. Uh, those are the propositions, Prop 2 passed in 08, and in, in uh, went into, was it, enacted in 2015, basically said exactly that, that poultry need to be able, along with other farm animals, but we're sticking with poultry, you know, exhibit their natural behavior, spread their wings, turn around, do these types of things, scratch, all that type of stuff. The problem is the wording was very nebulous. It was basically that. It didn't say anything about how much space, which would have been nice. There had to be subsequent uh, research to say how much space. Uh, the behaviors came up with a very strange number of 116 square inches per bird for a reasonable size coop, nine and above, so basically for everybody. That's an odd number because it's not a perfect square, for one thing. I don't even know how you come up with that number if you're talking about an object that basically will sort of wipe out a circular space. You would think you would need a square, but so be it. But, uh, following up on that, just in this past election, Prop 12 was passed here in California, which basically makes uh, that more concrete. It also, as of 2020, defines that the minimum, and it's minimum usable floor space, we'll talk about that in a second, has to be 121. So basically, it, it's uh, 11 on the side. 11 inches on the side of a usable floor space per bird. And so you need to make sure that you're adhering to that. Usable floor space means anything on the floor, and if you happen to have platforms like in a multi-tiered aviary-ish type system, that counts, perches and roofs don't. So you need to compute based upon that. I think most of you are not gonna have uh, multi-tier aviary, but if you do, you get to count that. Otherwise, it is truly the usable floor space it needs to be that minimum. By 2022, they also need to be cage uh, and and adherent to the uh, United Egg Producers Animal Husbandry Guidelines for 2017. I highly recommend you go download those. They're free. I just Googled and downloaded them yesterday. Again, it's the United Egg Producers Animal Husbandry Guidelines 2017. We will send out a link, or I'll just download it and send them to you. Uh, familiarize yourself with it, because by 2022, that's what you've got to do. If you are on the web here from another state, 
There are guidelines for your state. If you're going to sell into California, you have to adhere to that. But I'm sure there are guidelines for your state. Go figure out what they are. And then there are, if you want to be something uh, like uh, certified by American Humane or any of those things, that's above and beyond any of this. We get into those, but each of those types of requirements are sort of easy to find online. So other things chickens need, that was the big one, that's the one that's hardest to talk about. Um, other things that, that chickens need, protection from elements of the environment, uh, and that includes temperature extremes, protection from predators and pests, and it's not just the actions of predators and pests, but it's also the infectious diseases that they carry. Um, going back to what Mark Land was saying last week, and we'll talk about that stuff as well, reiterate the highlights, access to food and water, and then the things we kind of forget about are things like clean air, because there are issues with ventilation. Poultry houses, ammonia is produced from the droppings, the excrement, if you don't have adequate ventilation, ammonia builds up, affects your respiratory system, you get illnesses, you get drops in production. These are significant issues. You gotta think about ventilation and we will talk about all those things. So those are the kinds of things I want you to keep in mind as we're looking at all of these examples of different kinds of poultry housing. And one other thing that, that Prop 12 will dictate is by 2022, there is sort of a basic level of enrichment that is required in terms of things like scratch areas, perches, nest boxes, dust bathing areas, all that has to be present for layers. And Prop 12, I just reread it this morning, does not say anything about broilers. So I'm assuming they just don't care. Uh, so for broilers, I don't know of any particular restrictions. Again, if you are want to be American Humane certified or anything like that, that's a whole different ballgame. They do have considerations for that. But those, that's the perspective of what I want you to take here as we get into some of these. And right, so let's just start taking a look at some things to do. This is it's Lodi Farms out in Esparto. Um, hopefully Dan ends up here today. He's one of our producers on our panel. Uh, these are, are and like you will see in a number of these, they end up basically being sheds or larger structures on, on wheels. And that's exactly what we have here. There's a, a couple of things I want you to note and, and I'm gonna try to remember to use the mouse to point things out because that way the people online can see them. We can't talk about housing without talking about things like fencing, like helping with predator control with guard dogs. We're gonna talk about watering, things like that. But the basic construction of these is pretty simple and we'll get a shot of the inside, but the outside is basically paneling. We've got manual doors, ingress and egress. We've got the human access door here. Uh, I wanted to ask Dan about this. I hope he pops in. Looks like we've got a small solar panel. I don't know if he has accessory lighting in there. Uh, we do in ours and we'll talk about that. A lot of folks don't. Um, and in terms of fencing for these types of situations, it's, it's depending upon the predators you have, it's great to have a primary fence to keep out the major predators, primary meaning some sort of chain, something like that. The problem is fencing is expensive. In terms of a property, it's going to be one of the more expensive things to do and maintain, and that's the key is maintain. Having a secondary electrical fence on the inside is fabulous, but you also have to maintain that as well. I don't know if you guys remember the barriers of fire here uh, this past summer, but that was caused by an improperly maintained electrical fence, apparently. So what happens is, if you let the brush grow up next to the fence, only the bottom wire is a ground wire. That's the only thing that's meant to touch the ground. Anything else can conduct the ground. And if that ends up being dead brush, it can spark, start a fire. And apparently, that's what happened. So if you're going to do electric fence, you need to do it right. Okay. And these are examples of the chargers for electric fences. You can get these guys anywhere for cheap. I think the, the, the having enough chargers is the limiting factor depending upon how long your fence line is. But let's take a peek at the inside here. So 
Yep, there it is. So a couple things of note, <clears throat> basic wood construction. Wood is great, it's cheap, it's readily available, it's easy to work with the standard tools that you have. There are some downsides. It is porous, right? It can't hold water. So cleaning is not entirely ideal. It's tempting to think about doing things like getting pressure treated. Uh, the problem is it's pressure treated. There are chemicals. It's no longer arsenic, that's great, but they're copper compounds and we don't know what effect that has on eggs and development of birds and things. So that's not recommended. So standard wood. I suppose you could use a food grade paint if you wanted to on the inside. It adds expense, but it would certainly make your life easier, uh, potentially cleaning and disinfecting. So look, what we've got here, we've got a nice set of roosting bars. For roosting bars, the, the ballpark is about six to eight inches per bird. Question. You said food grade paint? Uh, ideally. I mean, if you're going to have if you're gonna be raising, especially organic, and if you're going to be having agricultural products, I, I think it would be preferable to have a food grade paint near those animals. Is that absolute? No. So, what does that actually mean? Well, it, it means it's sort of exactly that, that uh, it is suitable for any food type substance to contact with. Is this about the Kelly Boar store that's what you want? Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, roosting bars six to eight inches per bird approximately. Yo. What about the wire floor? We're getting, getting there. Not the best for their feet. We're getting there. Hold your horses, wet people. All right, so uh, six to eight inches per bird. Um, if you are going to have them extend over the nest boxes, which you see here, They've done good. They've put a roof, a slanting roof over the next boxes so they don't get pooped on, because they will. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the evidence of that. So, all right, let's talk about the wire floor since we're jonesing to do that. So wire floor benefits would be weight, uh, less weight, potentially easier to clean as things drop through. The problem with this particular design that I see is a couple fold. One, this is high enough off the ground that what do you see here? You see here and here are the birds, right? So what's gonna to happen to those birds? Pooped on. They're gonna get pooped on, and that is a mechanism for spreading disease. Okay. Clearly Dan hasn't had a huge problem with that, otherwise he would have fixed that, but that is, there's potential for issues there. Is wire really awful for their feet? I mean, that's sort of the dogma. I've gotta say, we haven't had a lot of problems here, right, Annie, with ours? And we do have wire floors, you will see in ours uh, here in a bit. Um, so is that overblown? Potentially. Now, the, the holes of the wire and the wire you want to use is nothing, nothing less than uh, hardware cloth, as it were. Uh, a welded wire, hardware cloth. That, that hole size looks about one by two, which is pretty good size rodents can get through that. Now, as high off the ground as this is, I think that helps. Ours are right on the ground, so a one by two hole size of something that's right on the ground, rodents gonna go right through that. <coughs> along here, you see an example of uh, water. It will catch up on the screen, maybe. Go web soon. Hello. It's not updated online. There we go. All right. So just one of many types of ways to provide water, tank water, feeding. Whoa, now we're going. Tank water, feeding, uh, the, the, uh, the, what are those called? I just forgot my train of thought here. Just the, um, somebody help me out. Feed. Thank you. So uh, the gravity, the buoyant feed with the, the valves on them. You use nipple drinkers, which you will see as well. You know, this is out in Esparto. I would imagine without that having a cover on it, that could get pretty hot. So that's a consideration. Get hot pretty fast. Yes, ma'am. Back to the coop design. Uh, what is the best width for the roosting bars? The best width. All right. So that's a little controversial. I'm fine with two by fours if you round them off. 
I mean, think about what a, a bird's foot looks like. It's approximately like this. It's not perfectly flat. They want to grab something. It can be too narrow. I almost think the ones that we use are a little bit too narrow, but it depends upon the brain size. But I think a two by four that you have rounded the corners on is perfect, to be perfect is what I prefer. So actually round. I think so. Maurice, I will be honest, prefers actually round. I, I think that could cause some problems. The two inch side on top? The two, I, um, yeah, so I actually think the, the four inch, which is nominally a lot smaller than four, round it can be just fine. The four inch side on top. And again, pay attention to what your birds are doing, pay attention to their breed. Size makes a huge difference. Yeah. Closet dowels. So again, closet you like dowels. closet dowels? I like wood branches off of trees. There we go. Branches off of trees, especially in the <laughs> rural houses too. Are closet dowels wide enough? Are you one of our producers, per chance? Yes. Which one are you? Saint John. All right. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So go. You want the ancient five cloth? What kind of birds do you have, just out of curiosity? <clears throat> and I've had bigger birds too. Oh, okay, and it looks great. There we go. Yeah. All right, sweet. Awesome. And that's, that's the kind of feedback we like to hear, is what are producers actually doing? How is it working with their birds? You're going to find all sorts of different ways to do things that either we haven't thought of, think didn't work, uh, and it worked perfectly fine. So, and if you're going to use closet valves, go to the lumber yard and tell them to call the factory and buy the mistakes. Because it'd be cheaper? Yes. All right, so if you didn't hear that, go to the lumber yard, tell them you want the mistakes for the, the closet rods. All right, so Eat Well Farms uh, out in Dixon are basically using repurposed mobile homes for this, larger than those last structures we saw. And basically they've adapted them to allow so in and out and ventilation is needed. It gets damn hot here. Again, ventilation is not just a summer problem. It actually can be trickier in the winter when we're not thinking about it. We want to close everything up. Still going to produce ammonia. You'll have to have a way for that to get out. You still need a minimum amount of ventilation during that period of time. And for them, they've provided water through an automatic system that they hook hoses through uh, with a since it's well water, a little bit of filtration. There's ventilation under the eaves. And then if necessary, they can move these around, but you can see these fields are pretty much fallow, so they're not moving these very often. All right, and then just last week we saw an example of River Dog Farms. Uh, what they've done is they've taken mobile home bases and they've built up from scratch on those. <clears throat> so uh, they're providing awnings, which move up and down, perfection from the sun, ventilation, in and out. Again, under the eaves, these are open, more ventilation available there. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Maybe I can pick the brains of people who've done this. We've, we've had mobile coops, and along with the tractor, it's like the mothership. Yeah. You know, the chickens get underneath it. They don't want to move. What are your tricks to getting them besides throwing feed out or, you know, but there's always someone left behind that can get run over. So what are the tricks you guys have? What do you, what are you using for your coops? What's your base? Is it on a mobile frame? Is okay. it on a mobile frame? Okay. Yep. yep. So you're using the skid. Is it custom fabricated or? There we go. Nice. Wow. Sweet. What about doing it at night after you go to bed? That's what he just said. That sounds really good. Didn't even think of that. <laughs> Another issue you have with the raised boats too, because I, I had cotton wagons to start with, is that you got to train them to walk up into the coop. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That was a tough one. To get them to walk up into it? Were they afraid? Oh, yeah. Or? yeah, because they want to, they want to raise underneath. Okay. Huh. But if you raise them inside of it and they were used to it, they will get used to it. You get to the point where you just give up. 
chick will be in the same. What about putting a light in there to attract them? Well, we use lights, but they still you have that group. I mean, we can go home right now and check 50 birds. It will not go in at night. Just you know. All right. And you guys are using artificial lighting? Oh, wow. All right. Thank you. Start the farmer panel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a panel for farmers very much looking forward to. But it's good to talk about yeah, sort of the, as we go along. Yep, because that, that's not the marketing and economics of it. That's more. All right. So, River Dog, you can't tell there's another structure on this side. And what they'll do is they'll string shade cloths here for additional predator protection for sharing clearly. And then you get your, your straggler here that thinks that you have to shoot in the camera together. <laughs> The examples of the nipple drinkers here, which is ends up being hooked to a gravity feed system. I, I like these just because there's not a lot of, uh, you don't get a lot of moisture ending up on the ground. What type of waters are you guys using? Bell drinkers. Using the bells? Yeah, that's what we do. do. What and about yours? wind and um, designing the coops so they aren't blown over? Blown over? That would be an awful lot of wind. I mean, I know we get the massive amounts here in Sparta, but what do you... Cotton wagons, I've had four go over. Really? How tall are they? What's, like, what's their... They just sit higher, so you okay. just have to support on one side. And then it's kind of, Interesting. But our rule is, like, we have big wind coming tomorrow night. We'll turn everybody in. into the wind. Yeah, that makes sense. So in terms of considerations on the inside, see you're perching your roosting bars here. Their doors roll up on a hand so they can get uh, the litter out. So now they're using straw because they grow it there. They grow their own grain. Straw doesn't absorb a whole lot, so they turn it over pretty quickly. They're doing it once a week. So being able to do that relatively easily, major consideration. So have some idea of what it is that your husbandry is going to require so that you can factor that into your design. Uh, and just a little bit of broiler. Last time, this is their their broiler uh, houses that they were saying they have uh, a hell of a time moving. They're basically 16 by 20. They put on dollies, move them in straight lines from from parts of pasture, to parts of the orchard, to other parts of the orchard. And on the inside, there's not a lot in terms of enrichment. There, it's basically food, water, not a lot of bedding. And again, Prop 12 doesn't say anything about that. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about what we're doing here on our, on our pasture poultry farm. This is one of our sort of uh, intermediate designs. It's, it's, about, it's about 12 by 12 by 20, somewhere in that range. Uh, holds about 180 birds on a trailer frame, which I'll show you in a second to see how we threw that one together. Pretty standard. Siding, external access to egg boxes that are tilted. They actually have covers uh, so they don't get predated. Uh, we've got uh, shade structures that go up and down on a pulley system because engineers love pulleys and don't necessarily have to have that. We have a gravity feed water system going into a trough water, which I'll show you a close up of that. That was easy to do. See an example of some of our shade structures here. Having additional shade structures, a good thing for uh, protection from predators as well as temperature control. Uh, those are easy to put together with PVC. You can tell that one is it needs a little bit of TLC. On the back side, a little closer view. This is how they're getting in and out. There is an automatic door there. That's only so practical. Uh, depending on the number of birds you have. With 180 birds, that works reasonably well. But if you've got a, a coop with 500 plus in it, you're not going to I don't think a single uh, automatic door is going to work particularly well for you. Question. <clears throat> you're not showing a lot of ventilation down low. It's all, has that been a problem for you? Not for us. Not for us. All right. So this is the, the base that we just got from a salvage yard, basically. Uh, and we just cleaned that up, repurposed it, and just started building a shed off of it. Essentially, it's, 
it's that type of construction. So standard two by four framing construction, nothing fancy to it. Uh, here's an example of our trough water. We just took PVC, saw it off the top, got a, a float valve uh, from, I think that one's from Amazon. You get a tractor supply, wherever it hooked up to our gravity feed, uh, and there you go. In terms of our more mobile chicken tractor type designs, we've gone through a couple of iterations, some that have worked, some that have not worked so well. Uh, this one we tried to get fancy, did a little hoop design here made of conduit, just electrical conduit. Uh, it's, it's, this is the sort of form where you've got the electrical conduit, a little bit of uh, two by four and plywood framing, uh, the, the uh, wire around the outside, the, the hardware cloth, which is about one half inch uh, opening. And the idea was it would be this movable. We would have roosting perching bars that were foldable that we'd be able to get up out of the way. I, the issues with this are we, there was too much of a trade off between rigidity of the structure and weight savings. It was really light, but the structure wasn't rigid enough to do what we needed to do. Moving it was a real pain in the ass, especially if the birds were in it. But even if they weren't, it ended up being uh, a problem. The, the nesting boxes uh, were plastic that ended up sagging. Uh, and so I'm going to hurry through this so I can show you our next indication since we are almost out of time here. Uh, a little more traditional two by four framing that has a, a mixed uh, floor with plywood and the hardware cloth. This roof actually slides to open ventilation. See the other side. This is the basic structure. This is designed to hold about 50 birds as were the previous uh, hoop model. So not a lot, but it's also made to be moved quite frequently. Inside, you've got this set of roosting perching bars with your nest boxes here. These bars fold up and out of the way as these are right here. So it allows more human access to walk on that plywood base. And there's in a later stage of development where we actually have the hardware cloth up and the, the way too complicated pulley system for the, for the engineers to and with the back view of our nest boxes, these flip up uh, so we can collect all the eggs. Again, they're on a slant, uh, and there's bombers in there to prevent egg breakage. All right, and we are right at 10 after, which is when I promised to stop talking. Uh, how about some questions? I see a couple here, right there. I visited those structures, and, and there was a matting or some kind of, I think it was plastic, uh, mats for the nest boxes. Yeah. yeah. Where do you? What is that called, and where do you get? We just ended up using uh, the artificial turf, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We ended up just using straight artificial turf. You get. What do you guys put in yours? Astro turf. Yep. That's it. Astro turf. I, but no, no, no. Let me finish. Oh. Nest had astro turf. Okay. What's the difference? About an inch of plastic. Okay. That used to be owned by That's the same bad. company. So if you go on and look up AstroTurf Nest Packs, that's what you um, I'm having a problem with my chickens actually going into the nesting boxes in, at night and pooping and making a huge mess. And so now they're not even laying their eggs in the nesting boxes. Oh, interesting. Now they're laying on the ground. And um, I was just wondering if anyone had an idea that my mom thought that maybe it was keeping them warmer. They do have plenty of perches, um, but we're just trying to figure out how to get them to put the eggs instead of the poop in there. Interesting. We have not had that problem. Has anyone else had that? There's some commercially available nesting boxes that have a... a That's arm. actually what we have, and I have found that they can just jump on that arm and knock it down and still get in at night. So. Do they have adequate roost space? Absolutely, place? yes. They just have bad birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're bad girls. Maybe it's a social interaction. Have yeah. they always done that? Since no, wow. no. They were using the nesting box correctly, and then just a, a, probably a couple months ago, they started doing this. Yeah. 
I don't know if it's because it's um oh just about 2025. 20, how much space? Um, I, I think it's probably like a 10 by 10 shed. Have you found any of them dead in the nest? No. So it's not predator sneaking around. Oh well, no. No. How often nice. do you clean the nest boxes? Well, I've been doing it a lot more now <laughs> than I used to. Um, but I don't know if it's because it's up higher, so maybe it feels more like they're roosting and staying warm. And how high are they off the ground? The, the box is probably about three and a half feet up. Ooh, how high are the perches? The perches are probably about five feet. Hmm. So we were wondering if maybe we put the box down lower. I think that's worth a shot. Okay. Any other interesting ideas out there? I'm curious, why did you paint your things red instead of the university colors? Oscar? <laughs> it was cheap. Well, that's the answer to everything. It was cheap. Okay. Cheaper than blue and gold? Seems <laughs> red a little bit. Easier. Yeah. I was curious about, looks like there's two sets of nesting boxes, yep. one high and one low. Yep. Um, is there, you know, on the inside, I didn't see quite how they got to those. They just fly up there. I don't have a picture of that, only of this. I don't have a good picture of the inside on them. Well, maybe I do. Hold on, let me look. I don't remember if I included that one. I don't think I did. Oh, okay. What's your... I was curious if... If there was issues, and you know why it's so high? Yeah, we have not had any issues, and I do show uh, they do show sort of a, a inclination to use particular nesting boxes. They actually tend to be in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually just going to measure that just for curious. So we put little sensor pads in there to see which ones they use, how often. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's in progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to see if, if there's issues with it, but we haven't had any problems with that. Do you know what the pitch is on the bottom of the oh, God. What is our pitch, Oscar? Do you remember? Okay. No. It, there's actually a recommended value. I'll have to check and see what that is. Do you remember offhand? I don't. We don't go. Well, we've got what happens is with our nest pads, it slows it down. Good. So, and we have what size eggs and how many birds and the other So, we don't go. I don't, and you basically you guys know what the angle is. If they break, it's too much. Yeah, and you got to have. I don't know if you have a piece of that's kind of the end of the roll yeah. out. Yeah, the first ones they did. Yeah, we do. So you so. talked about space, floor space. Yes. What about vertical space? The requirements say that if you have twelve inches above. And the next space is counted, or does it have to be 24 inches? I not say anything in Prop 12 specifically about that. So again, if you want to be you know, any of the humane regulated, that's all different ballgame of Prop 12. It doesn't say anything about birds. All right, better cut it off there. If you have other questions, please feel free to ask. We'll get to them either now or we'll, we'll email the answers later. Let's take about five minutes here. And Ambire is going to get started on regulations. Thanks so much. I appreciate your attention.